Matthew Taylor, thanks so much for coming on to Talk Beliefs from your home here in the UK. You are the co-host of the Still Unbelievable podcast, which offers thoughts and rebuttals to the popular Christian podcast, Unbelievable, with Justin Brierley. You also host the Proscenium podcast, and your blog is entitled Confessions of a Young Earth Creationist, and the link to that is found on reasonpress.net. Well, you lead quite a busy life between your writing and podcasting. So uh, how has it been going the past few months? Have you found you've had more or less time to uh, concentrate on your projects? I've enjoyed lockdown. Lockdown's been great. It's created quite a lot of extra time for me to be able to get involved with these projects that uh, I'm involved with that you've already mentioned. It's enabled me to take part in Alpha Online. So yes, lock. Uh, lockdown and me going into furlough right from the very beginning back in mm. april has created a lot of time for me to do this and touch on some other projects that i've been thinking about and start the fruits or some of the ideas of other projects that i've been involved with so that's been a great opportunity for me sadly now in the last couple of weeks i've returned back to full-time work so my time is now <laughs> drastically reduced and so i'm trying to manage how and prioritize which of my ideas uh, it yeah. needs to be worked on before the others. Well, today we're going to be deconstructing the Alpha Course, as we said, a weekly course held in many churches as a way of answering questions about Christianity and encouraging people into the faith. It's a subject you've explored at length on the Still Unbelievable podcast, but I thought it might be interesting to get an overview of Alpha and what it attempts to do and just how successful it really is. But before we dive into the world of the Alpha course, let's just hear about your background. You had a uh, very interesting upbringing growing up as a young earth creationist in uh, the mission fields of Zambia. Yes, uh, I did. My, the, my earliest memories are of growing up in Zambia. I love Zambia. I'm very emotionally uh, connected to Zambia as a country. It formed all of my earliest memories, uh, my exposures to to cultures and to different people is all part of my my upbringing in Zambia and I absolutely treasure so many of those experiences uh, and those memories but as you say my my upbringing was predominantly within the missionary environment in Zambia I don't think any of the adults that I was uh, exposed to as a young child were anything other than Christians and so for me growing up the there was the concept of questioning Christianity just wasn't a feature of any of my thinking or, or of any of the education that I had. And, and so I have very mixed feelings about the role of missionaries and missionary culture in countries like Zambia. For an, an example, the school that I went to was in a very remote and very rural part of Zambia. And what missionaries do is they, they provide care for, for people in those rural areas. That's a great thing. Absolutely. It's a humanist thing to do. And people who I'm related to built hospitals and schools mm. and, and, and other parts of infrastructure, roads even, water for rural villages. These are great humanist uh, ideas and I, I applaud the concept behind all those. But because it's missionaries what's doing it, what's happening is all of this provision, all of this care and specifically medical care, etc., is provided by Christians. And so there's, there's this... Um, this attitude that comes as part of the person who is a missionary because their primary goal is spreading the, the word of God. Their primary goal mm. isn't necessarily uh, the care of, of the people that they're, they're serving in that community. So when people, like I say, people who I'm related to have built hospitals and infrastructure in these remote areas, they've also built Bible colleges, they've also built churches so that those who are rural who are coming to the hospital for the medical care because it's superior medical care are also pressured into attending the church into expressing a, an adherence to christianity and if people certainly if people here for there for a longer period of time whether it's giving birth or or whether it's longer term medical care maybe they're seeking treatment from malaria which is obviously a common common thing or other even even longer term medical care illnesses they, they're coming in and they're as part of the medical care, they're being immersed into this uh, culture of Christianity as well. And so they're going back out and they're, they're spreading that back out to their villages. And so the whole concept of, of providing care is also pushing people in, into Christianity. And 
what I find slightly nefarious about this is the acceptance of, of and teaching of Christianity also means that the people who are spreading Christianity are also then speaking out against what they see in the culture that they don't like, mm -hmm. the, the conflicts with what they're bringing in. So in, indigenous practices, uh, cultures that are, are local to the area, uh, that are alien to the incoming missionaries and to the white westernized mis missionaries are being actively rejected and being spoken against. So there's this, this insipid changing of the culture and changing of attitudes. And so what's happening right. is, as part of missionaries coming in and spreading Christianity, they're also um, pillaging the local culture and they're teaching all of the local indigenous people how to be modern white people and i think it's that that i really find really discomforting uh, about that because when i go to other parts of the world on holiday i want to experience and see other cultures see how other people live and what's happening in these uh, rural areas or around the world where missionaries go is they're they're changing the, the culture and so the culture becomes a westernized culture that's being operated by people who are unfamiliar with that foreign culture and that's the bit that i really don't like mm -hmm. about uh, the impact of missionaries in that in that part of the world uh, and i haven't focused a lot on it yet on my podcast still unbelievable because i've been focusing mostly on on arguments against christianity but this is one area that i'm also looking at and maybe when alpha's gone and we, i've done the whole whole alpha project mm. i'll start looking into to other areas and other impacts of christianity around the world because i'm really discomforted by by that side effect of mission missionary activity in other parts of the world yeah that, that would be good i hope you can do that matthew well, today we're going to be talking about the Alpha Course, which attempts in a small way to present evidence for Christianity. But the evidence for Christianity, specifically creationism, that you encountered when you were still a Christian just didn't stack up against the scientific explanations. Isn't that right? Yes, that's absolutely right. But it wasn't until I moved back to the UK as an adult and to live and to make my life uh, as an adult that I got a exposure to those kinds of arguments and um, so by by that time I was an adult I I'd left a compulsory education so any kind of learning took its time and so I was a young earth creationist well into adulthood well past my 30s and um, it wasn't until I got a job must have been about 15 years ago now I got a job where I was working from home because I'm an IT professional so I work in IT mm -hmm. so working home was uh, an option then and about 15 years ago that was when so we're talking the early 2000s the iPod yep. had come out podcasting was starting to happen so working from home I wanted I started looking around for something else to listen to at home other than just music and so I discovered podcasts and I discovered a few scientific podcasts because although I hadn't done a lot in terms of exposure to science and investigating scientific claims I wasn't I did still have an interest in science and what I found during that time was listening to scientific podcasts was I experienced for the first time in my life what we now know as cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. and I struggled with that I struggled with that for a, a long long time because I was hearing these scientific explanations and they made sense to me but they conflicted with what I knew in my heart about young earth creationism and there was this battle and this battle lasted quite some time and I really really struggled with what I was listening to and I remember one time I I listened to some arguments about the age of our solar system and I understood the arguments and I understood why that they had the conclusions they came to but I didn't agree with the conclusions and I couldn't reconcile that to my mind so I went hunting for Christian podcasts that, that would help me to resolve that and I found that I wasn't satisfied by what the Christian podcasts were doing mm. and so I very quickly deleted those Christian podcasts because I realized that they weren't actually talking about science they're talking about their interpretation of the bible and saying well our interpretation of the bible means this therefore what the scientists say must be wrong and i found that i was dissatisfied with that as a conclusion i think that must have been the very first chink in in my christianity at, at that moment so i went back to the science podcast and i started realizing that actually there was there was good good arguments there were good points in the arguments they were saying but more than the good points in the arguments their arguments were based on very solid evidence and that the evidence had been tested the evidence had been verified and this had been built up over many many years of consistent scientific discovery and uh, and collection of data collection of evidence 
testing the evidence, validating the evidence versus different methods, etc. And there was just this creeping realization that actually I shouldn't be challenging what the science was saying because other people had already done that for me and their conclusions could be trusted. So I needed to make another decision. And that decision was what do I do about the conclusions that I come to, which I couldn't justify by evidence. Of course, the answer is obvious. If you can't justify it by evidence, you ditch it and you look for what you replace it with. So that was when my young earth creationism started uh, creeping away. And I say that that my the whole process. I think my young my young earth creationism died first. My but my entire mm -hmm. deconversion I usually say took about around about three years. And it was three painful years. It was a difficult time because there was cognitive dissonance all the way. But I think once. The young earth creationism had, had died and I realized that there were major parts of the Bible that I couldn't take literally anymore. And there's major points in the in the Old Testament, the most key ones being Adam and Eve's story in the Garden of Eden, the Tower of Babel about whole languages, Noah and his flood about the whole earth. But there are others as well. But those are the three major big ones that fall as part of young earth creationism. The, but the scientific conclusions and, and the evidences that science says are consistently reliable and we consistently you know, retest and test and test via different methods and come to those different conclusions there. And it was that sliding scale that really I thought, where do I stop? At what point in this slide down the, the scale of Christianity, where do I stop throwing stuff into the bin? And I realized that I just didn't stop. And then suddenly one day I was literally, I was walking down the streets and I was just going through these last dregs together and it got to the question of God. I thought, having done all of this, can I really accept the Christian God? And I think that was when I just said, actually, no, I can't because there's nothing left to justify it. Alpha's an opportunity to explore the meaning of life. And it's an opportunity to discuss the really big questions like, why am I here? What's the purpose of life? Does life have an ultimate meaning? Okay, now let's get on to the Alpha Course. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, what exactly is the Alpha Course and uh, what are its origins? Alpha goes back probably about 30 years or, or so. The face of Alpha is Nicky Gumbel, who is the pastor. Well, uh, vicar is probably the correct word of, of Holy Trinity Brompton, a church in London here in the UK. And he's the famous face behind Alpha. Although Alpha did exist before Nikki got involved in it, I can't remember the name of the individual uh, who who did originally write Alpha, but he wrote some base material which forms the, the, the origins of Alpha. And then I don't know the story behind Nikki getting hold of it, but when Nikki got hold of it, he rewrote a lot of it and polished it up and presented it in the alpha course that we're familiar with now so he wrote the book designed the logo that we're very familiar with of a, of a man question carrying mark, a large yeah. question mark yeah a great great logo and that logo is maybe had minor changes over years but that is alpha that is what we think of when, when we think of alpha and and then Nikki made it into a into a course, broke it down into into chunks, into bite-sized pieces, and into into segments to make it easily absorbable and easily adoptable. And that's what made up the part of the book. And then he created video sermons uh, about it. And um, so, so that's how Nikki Nikki created it and presented it now. And for most of the last twenty, maybe even twenty-five years. Nikki's been presenting Alpha and he's sort of broken it down into other churches can now do it because that's the power of Alpha. That's why Alpha is so good and so strong is that it, its format is consistent and its format is easily digestible and other churches across the country can take that same course, show the video of Nikki preaching and lead to small groups in their own congregations or in their own environments or even in a house if need be because it's designed for small groups and people can discuss around it as well. And I think that's one of the key key points about Alpha is it's a discussion. It's intended to design, it's designed to stimulate and to spark group discussion so that the people who are attending can talk around the ideas and ask their questions together and so that people feel that they're involved. And I think that's part of its power is there's an investment into it, not just in time and turning up, but emotionally in terms of engaging with what's being said, with the content of the video, and then engaging in the questions, asking questions of people, listening to other people's answers. Because the nature of it is it's disparate people coming together. People have different ideas, different preconceptions, different backgrounds. 
And I found this when I do it. So people have different ideas of specific parts of Christianity, you know, about how the Holy Spirit behaves, about how prayer works, and all these kinds of things about what constitutes a convincing argument or not. So you get people who disagree about little things. And so you have this, and the whole of Alpha is geared to encourage a discussion. And so the, the leader of the, the group, who obviously will be a Christian, will probably have been a Christian, mature Christian for sem- several years. They'll be familiar with the Alpha material, but they're not there to tell you what Alpha says. They're there to, to guide the conversation. So if the conversation goes, goes a little bit flat or a little bit dead, they'll ask another question to, to gear it up again or pick up on things that people have said and just promote discussion around the group. And I really enjoyed that aspect of Alpha, and I think that's really the power of Alpha, and it's the investment of the people involved. You're not being talked at. You're not being preached to. You're involved in the conversation. Matthew, you signed up for an Alpha course not that long ago and revealed your thoughts and criticisms on recent episodes of Still Unbelievable. So let's go through your experiences. Uh, I myself did several Alpha courses over the years out of pure you know, curiosity, and I'm wondering if you came to the uh, same conclusions that I did. So what can you tell us about the format of this course? What happens, say, day one when you walk through the door? Well, I think obviously the key difference between the types of alpha that you and I went on is I did it online. But for those who are listening, normally alpha would be, it will be attended at the church. So Mm. you would arrive at the church, although it doesn't have to be a church. It could be somebody's large house or a hall or something like that. But the idea is that you turn up as a group, maybe a dozen people into what should be a safe place. And it usually starts with food a meal, greeting, so you just get to know each other. You have It relaxes the environment, and then you watch the video by Nikki. And so you'll have between 20 and 30 minutes of, of video from, from Nikki, which will be presenting the subject, a bit of, of sermon, a bit of an introduction of other people talking about how this aspect of Christianity that you're about to discuss has affected their lives. And then you go into the group time where you discuss the points raised in the video, and you'll, you'll talk around various subjects. Sometimes the conversation, as when you get humans together, the conversation will uh, go on a tangent a little bit, and that'll be the, the role of the group leader to either let the tangent ride because it's still relevant or to just bring the conversation back around again. And the whole intention is to try to make it low pressure so that people feel able to express their thoughts. So online, it was slightly different. We did it in Zoom meetings. Uh, I'd been looking, I'd, I'd just do a pause here, I'd actually been looking as part of Still Unbelievable podcast to do an alpha mm. critique. So I'd been looking, actively looking for a church in my area that was running alpha. I work over uh, in Bristol. So I was looking for a church in that area that was hopefully doing alpha that I could pop in and do alpha after yeah. work. It was quite hard to find one in the week that worked with me, but I was looking around for it or one that was maybe local to me uh, here at home further south in Somerset. But I was struggling to to find one. And of course, Alpha Online came and said, this was a great opportunity when Alpha announced that they were doing online. So I jumped on that. So the way it worked for me, it was a Zoom meeting. There again, it was about a dozen people on the Zoom meeting and uh, it would be about two and a half hours each one evening a week. And so about the first 20 minutes, 30 minutes, it was just chat, catch up on the week, say hello to people. I really liked it. It was a great bunch of people, I genuinely, and I, and I do mean this with all sincerity. I got to like all the people that were on it. And um, we ate, we had great chats. There were different people, different personalities. There were different things that I had in common with different people. And it was wonderful. It was really nice to have that social chat because I'm a social person. I'm very much mm. an extrovert. I genuinely miss weekly, uh, my weekly Wednesday talking to those people. Well, there are 11 sessions over 11 weeks, plus the weekend away, uh, which we'll talk about soon. Now, the sessions are entitled, Is There More to Life Than This? Who is Jesus? Why did Jesus die? How can I have faith? Etc. Matthew, what are your memories of these sessions? Were any solid apologetics offered, and how deeply were people encouraged to to question these uh, faith claims? I am unconvinced because it is a light touch introduction to Christianity. The um, What I am really disappointed by is uh, the area of evidence that's uh, approached to by Alpha. Mm. There are points that are presented as evidence for Christianity, but they, they write very early on in the first couple of episodes. And then what happens is the next episode comes along and then they go into 
the teachings of Christianity, the uh, the um, the, the core tenets of, of Christianity. And uh, when you get to that point, which is about episode four, um, the evidence part is all left behind. Uh, and I think that's my my that's the point where I'm really sharply critical of uh, the alpha format, is because the evidence is touched on. There's not really much of it because you can't really touch on much in in a 25 minute talk from Nikki and then the conversations that you have after it. But the difficulty that I have is that the evidence um, is assumed that it's settled and then when they move into the arguments for Christianity and that it's talked about as though the discussion on evidence is done, sorted and Christianity is now accepted to be true. And that's the problem that I have. To give a very specific example, one of the early episodes, either two or three, it talks about the concept of textual criticism. Mm -hmm. And um, the words that, that Nicky uses in his talk about it are, it might not actually be Nicky who says it, but whoever it does that says it in the video, they're very careful about the words that use and say, describe textual criticism as uh, analysing the, the content of the original text, which is true, that is what textual criticism does does do it allows you to compare the text that we have now with the texts in the earliest documents and it allows us to give a level of confidence mm. on on the accuracy of what the original documents said what that does not tell you is whether or not what the original document said is true and i think that's a very key point but what happened is in this episode it accurately describes what textual criticism is and about analyzing the content of uh, the original documents but then when you go into the group time and um, uh, pe some people did seem to miss that that crucial point and then when you get on to the, the later episodes they yeah. they talk about the Christianity being shown to be true to be known to be true but we don't know that because when it made reference to textual criticism it doesn't tell you that it's true. It just tell, tells you that what was written is a fair representation of what we have now. That's not an endorsement of the content of the of the actual truth value of the words that are used. And so there's this twisting, um, and it's it's that um, I don't want to say it's intentionally dishonest, but it feels like it. Mm. And it, it's that aspect of, of Alpha which I really, really struggled with and I am the most highly critical of. And you'll hear that in the podcast episodes that we've already recorded. It will probably come up again in, in future ones because it is a returning theme uh, that came up multiple times uh, in Alpha. And, and it was that I was really, really disappointed by that aspect of Alpha. I didn't see it coming. I wasn't expected it, and I was really quite taken aback when I encountered it. That's right, and I remember when they uh, they mentioned Josephus, of course, as an ancient historian who yeah. uh, who had uh, written about Jesus. Of course, he hadn't. He he basically mentioned Christianity existed and Christians existed, and they quickly just sort of glossed over that. And I remember saying, um, "Well, but isn't that is aren't parts of that a forgery?" And he wasn't yeah. an eyewitness, and they just kind of said. Well, moving on. <laughs> yes, there are huge, huge difficulties with uh, the con with the broader content of what Josephus has written, and there are other things that Josephus has written which are known to be untrue anyway. So all of that mm. causes it to question the reliability of the words that uh, Josephus uses. But when people refer to Josephus in the context of Christianity, they ignore all of that. They just say, "Hey, look, this other Christor this other historian who's not part of the the Bible history, he wrote about Jesus. Therefore, it's true." Uh, but hang on a minute, it's not that simple. Well, when I think back to the Alpha courses I attended, I came away with the conclusion that the entire thing seemed to revolve around ensuring that attendees signed up for the weekend away. Now, this could be at another church or at an event space in another town. Uh, one of the weekends away I went on was down in Sussex, a two-hour bus journey, I think it was, from London, where the course was being held. Uh, it's on the weekend away that they hit you with the so-called speaking in tongues phenomenon, which they hope, I think, will be the final clincher for any course member who may still be on the fence. Uh, would you agree? Yes, pretty much. I, I would agree on that. I, 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 
I was a Christian for long enough to have been on many church weekends uh, away where a, a church group and they'll have kind of like a, a spiritual weekend and members of the church will go go away to, to help themselves and to get some teaching from somebody else and there'll be that kind of aspect in those those churches mm-hmm. as well at those weekends and they'll look, inevitably the the it's usually a wife who's got a non-believing partner and they'll be encouraged to come along to that weekend as well because otherwise they just don't see their spouse for the entirety of the weekend and those can be high quite high pressure for those individuals as well so i know what those weekends can be like as a christian and so i knew what i know what to expect and so i fully expected that alpha would be that kind of thing so when i was thinking about doing an alpha I had to ask myself the question, what do I do about the weekend away? How do I respond to that? Because I knew that will be, there will be elements of that that I wouldn't enjoy uh, because I've rejected Christianity and I've rejected that whole entire spiritual aspect of Christianity. So I needed to reconcile in my mind how I would handle that, how I would deal with those things because there'll be a great temptation for somebody like myself to go into an environment like that mm. and be, be rude to be unkind, to be in really, really gruffly dismissive. And while I might be thinking that in my mind, I really had to think through how I would respond to that w- with honesty and w- with integrity, but also without intentionally upsetting and hurting other people. Because by that point in the Alpha course, there'll be individuals that you're on the group with who you would probably call a friend, even if you don't see them again after the Alpha course. For that moment in your life, they are a friend. They're somebody that you've shared, possibly even uh, intimate parts of your your life with in terms of facts and and details, people that you trust, Mm -hmm. not just on a truthful level, but possibly on an emotional level as well. So I had to process and think through how I would respond to to my utter, utter rejection of the spiritual side of Christianity, to people who are really accepting of it and to people who who I now trust emotionally. So this was a challenge for me and I really, really had to think through if I'm going to commit to doing an alpha course for my podcast, I have to commit to going on the weekend away and I have to commit to engaging with that in in a way that is honest. Um, And... I was um, I was still actually processing that. Obviously, the answer is yes, I would do it, and I would do it to the best of my ability, and I would try to be as impartial as I possibly could because that's the only way to be honest about analysing Alpha in the way that I am. Um, and so when I started doing Alpha online, I thought, okay, how are they going to do this? Mm. Because you can't really do it in the same way, and you can't have an extended three-hour praise meeting with uh, yeah. with a call to prayer, with laying on of hands and uh, praying in for the infilling of the Holy Spirit in a Zoom meeting. It, you know, the, Zoom has enabled so much, but I'm not really sure it can handle that. So the way, basically the way that uh, they did it in on Alpha Online, for certainly on, on my one, I don't know if other people's experience has been different. So they condensed, because I think... Alpha weekend is three sessions, so there will be three videos to watch. The way we, it was done was it was condensed to a Saturday morning. So it was about three, maybe four hours on a Saturday, starting about 10 or 11 a.m. And, and ending just after lunch. And um, we could, we dropped it down to two videos to watch. So we, we did our usual, you know, hello, here's a cup of coffee, etc., And then did the first video, broke it down, had a chat, relaxed a bit had a cough break and then went and did the, the second video. So it was it was radically cut down. And it basically felt like the usual Wednesday evening, but in daylight. It can't really, the Alpha Online couldn't really fully replicate the, the wow. weekend away experience. So let's be fair about that. They tried as best they could. And I think the solution they came up with was probably the best that they could do. I think for me personally, I'd have been very happy to have made it for much much longer and and done almost the whole saturday started at 10 you know and gone through and even had had lunch on on zoom just to just increase that emotional connection between people and then go on until about four o'clock on saturday i'd have been prepared to to do that uh, for alpha online but you know you've got to think about other people's lives you've got to think about the impact on that you know they're people who are parents uh, doing this kind of thing. So it might not be practical and realistic uh, to do that. So I think they did the best they could possibly do in a, in a compromised situation. 
Matthew, you've looked into the success rate of these alpha courses and how they perform, not just before, but also during uh, the recent lockdown. What did you find out regarding success rates in terms of getting people to accept Christianity, as well as the dropout rate? Um, what are the demographics? Okay, well, before I answer that, I need to set a little bit of context uh, here. I did try to get somebody from Alpha, and if anybody listening and watching has got any contacts to Alpha and had, knows somebody from Alpha, it doesn't have to be an official representative, somebody who's led an Alpha group or something like that, who wants to come and talk to me on my podcast mm -hmm. about your experiences of Alpha, genuinely, I would love to hear from you, and let's try and uh, make that happen. You'll, you'll find me really engaging, and I would really genuinely love to hear about you and your experiences, so, so please contact me on that. So I did try, did contact Alpha head office, and I did try to get somebody to come on to my podcast and have a conversation about about Alpha, about the experience of uh, running Alpha. I failed to do that, but what I did manage to do was I managed to speak to somebody, uh, have a, about an hour conversation with somebody at Alpha. Uh, his name is Mark. I think he's involved in the finance part of Alpha, and we had a genuinely lovely conversation. He and he he declined to appear on the podcast, but he did make some time for me to have a conversation. He's a genuinely lovely gentleman. We had a really mm -hmm. good conversation. But what he, what, he, what he did help for me is he, he helped to clarify some of the, the, the uh, objectives of Alpha, the, the way that they think uh, and the reasons for some of the decisions uh, that they make. And that was really helpful. So, so it's from that conversation that some of the information I'm about to, to give comes. So I'm really interested. You asked a really valid question about demographics. And I think that's a very important question. This is a question that I too was really mm. interested with. And if you go and listen to to our podcast, uh, Darren, who joins Andrew and myself on Still Unbelievable, who he didn't attend Alpha, but he watches the videos and he was he's never been a Christian. And uh, he helps us to to dissect some of the arguments that uh, for Christianity that come up in the Alpha videos. And he, he brought it up as well and he expressed a bit of surprise about it. Uh, as well. So I think storing demographics is a really important thing in this diff this um, in this digital age as well. It'll be really easy for the people running Alpha courses to keep a record of the kinds of people that attend Alpha, their ages, uh, their backgrounds, their exposure to Christianity, their conversion rates, and all that kind of thing. And that would help in their responses to certain arguments. Of Christianity. I think this is a really key point. If you keep a record of how people respond to the arguments for Christianity that they're giving, you can adjust the arguments to make them mm -hmm. more effective. You can ditch the ones that are not effective. And I think that point specifically would be really good for Alpha for fine tuning the content of, of their courses so that they can tune it to what works and away from what doesn't work. So in terms of the whole demographic thing, I'm surprised they don't do it for that specific reason alone. Yeah. Uh, what Mark did say to me was that they intentionally don't record demographics. And the reason why is sure. they want to keep the light touch, no pressure aspect of alpha as its, as its core um, attribute. That is what they want. They want people to be free and to be comfortable to walk into a church, attend an alpha and walk out again and make their own decision on what they want to do. They don't want them to feel like there's somebody who's now got their name, address, and phone number who's going to go chasing them up and say, where are you? We haven't seen you at church. They don't want people to feel that committing to Alpha commits them to receiving that phone call. So that's one of the reasons why they don't uh, record any demographics, because they, they want that freedom and that low-pressure ethos to be paramount to people. And they're very, very key and important on that. And Mark really laid that out on me, that that really was very important to, to Alpha. And I get that, and I understand that, but I still want to refer back to the point I've just made about improving the quality of the, the arguments and the, the message of Christianity in Alpha. I think keeping some record will help them improve their message of Christianity. So, um, but I get that, and I applaud Mark, and I implored Alpha for having that kind of, of ethos. So when we talked a little bit about demographic and about, about drop-off, I said that the the group that I was on, there'd been about 30% of the people. So I think it started with 15, ended with 12. Several had dropped off, a couple had joined partway through, about three, three or four, a couple of people more joined in. But the number of people at, at the last week was fewer than the number of people at, at the first week. And when I explained to Mark that that was my experience of, of Alpha, he said, 
that's about typical in the in the physical alpha as well you'll get about a 30 percent drop off and maybe one or two additional people will come in in the early weeks of alpha but the end is always lower than the start so that seems to be the typical thing but they don't keep anything about background about age about gender or any of those kind of defo demographics that a statistician hmm. would love to go trawling through and, and seeing what they do they don't even record what how people respond to the various arguments and all that one thing that i can tell you is uh i was on an alpha my part my podcast partner andrew he was also on an alpha and then we had another third individual who's also yeah. giving us some information who's also a part, uh, on an alpha and we all reported roughly the same thing in terms of atheist christian demographic on our courses i was the only vocal atheist on my alpha but there was another person who called himself agnostic but essentially he's probably atheist too and um, we agreed on an awful lot of things and uh, he really enjoyed taking taking the christian view and poking me with, with some really good questions and uh mm -hmm. he and i had some lovely conversations and, and we still communicate a little bit by email and i really enjoyed those kind of sparring things because he asked some really really good questions that christians sometimes didn't ask and, and that was that was great but at the end of the day we were we both walked away from it saying no we we can't accept christianity on what we've seen so that was two in in that alpha i was on my part, my podcast partner Andrew, he had very similar experience on his alpha. He had a greater number of people on his alpha. I think it was as much as thirty on his alpha, and he was the only atheist on his alpha. The uh, the other person who was um, uh, on it with that, who did another alpha for us, he did one. It was very similar to me. I think it was about twelve or fifteen on his alpha. He was the only atheist there. So if we roll that out across, and you know. We can only tell you about three online alphas. We can't tell you yeah. with any reliability whether this is true for every single alpha, but it does seem to be the pattern that the number of atheists of my kind of atheism, really strong, really convinced, they've already heavily uh, critiqued uh, the arguments for Christianity and have already reached their conclusions uh, on those. You're not going to find those people on a normal alpha unless mm -hmm. somebody has really dragged them onto it or they've done what I've done and, and read that. I think that kind of person is going to be very rare in alpha courses. The majority personal alpha, and that was true for my alpha, for Andrew's alpha and, and for the other alpha, is it's people who have um, a fluctuating interest with Christianity. They're either committed to Christianity and want to experience alpha, which was true for, for mine, or they're people who are fringe Christians. They've got people who are Christians who, who go to church. They've been encouraged to go along and to attend it. And they haven't got the, um, I apologize in advance, it's going to sound patronizing uh, and um, and it, it's not intending to, uh, but their, their exposure to the scientific arg arguments that I've done, whether it's by intent or, or design or whether it's just a meet feature of their life, they're, just isn't as isn't as rich they they don't they don't habitually live on science blogs they don't habitually live listening to science podcasts I, I consume an enormous amount of science content on a weekly basis these people who don't do that and so when they when they listen to the christian arguments they they don't jump to the same uh, critical analysis uh, that i might do and like i told you it was going to sound patronizing i I'm trying not to be, but I'm, I'm just trying to be as realistic as I possibly can. And so I was listening to people and they would pick up something that was said uh, about, um, about, like, for example, somebody would say on one of the Alpha videos, we have evidence for Christianity or we have evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And I'll be sitting there thinking, well, actually, no, it's not quite technically evidence. It's claims that are written in the Bible, but we can't really evidentially support them. They're just claims. And... But what will happen is these people will repeat the words verbatim that were said in the video, we have evidence for Christianity, and accept it and not actually think, well, what does it mean? What do they mean by evidence? What 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 are the justifiable conclusions from what they're referring to as evidence? They don't well, ask these questions. They just accept what's said as true and then move on to the next step and say, yeah. and so um so you get a lot of that kind of kind of person. And it's really difficult when when it's somebody like myself 
who wants to jump on that kind of comment and have a run with a 10 minute monologue uh, <laughs> tearing down uh, some of the assumptions behind that kind of sentence it's it's really quite difficult and there are times when just to be nice i kept my mouth shut because like i say by this point in um, uh, in the course these are people that i like and i know that if i jump on full skepticism I might upset yeah. someone or I might cause some offence. <laughs> I, I, I genuinely, I know if I people have... Been, yeah, and um, it, it's hard because sometimes I really want to say something sharp, so, something um, re that really dissects what's being said. Uh, but I'm also very, very familiar with the pain of cognitive dissonance in my mind. I know it hurts. And I know it creates very confused um, thinking. So, the, yeah, so the demographics was these edge people, mostly, who were potentially really easily convinced by, by arguments that should be easy to tear down. And I think that was part of my concern about, about Christianity. I'm sorry, about, about part of Alpha. Because the secret weapon of Alpha and actually it's a secret weapon of convincing people into Christianity, isn't really the arguments that are given in the videos. It isn't really the um, Nikki standing behind a pulpit and, and giving uh, what is often a very well-spoken um, um, exposure or e extrapolation of that particular element of Christianity. That's not the true power of Alpha. The true power of Alpha is the personal testimonies. In each Alpha video, you'll get segments of somebody telling their story about how they went from from a life that was terrible, a life that is that nobody wants, through Alpha or some kind of Christian experience into a life that is admirable. And there are multiple of these throughout the Alpha videos. And of course, in the course of yeah, for video, you'll hear this kind of story in your small groups as well. That is what the true power of Alpha is. People are much more convinced by somebody else's experience than they are by a greatly orated argument or by a detailed scientific explanation. So emotion comes into it a lot, doesn't it? Absolutely. It really is a secret, Christian, secret weapon of, of Christianity. And I saw this happen. And... People would refer back to the testimonies. If it can, if this can happen to their life, it can happen to my life. And when people were telling their stories about what they perceived to be an answer for prayer, or their experience of the Holy Spirit, or their, their experience of something that confirmed uh, Christianity, it was always a very emotional, personal story. And that is really where the mm. true power of convincing people into Christianity lies. And it was, it was that. And so my walk away from from Alpha is that if people are going to come into Alpha, it's those personal accounts that are really going to get people into Alpha. And I'm pretty sure, and as a Christian, I have given my own testimony as, as a Christian multiple times, and I've heard other people's Christian testimony multiple times, and they are, they are massively, massively convincing. And I think we do Christianity a disservice if we underappreciate how powerful personal stories are in getting people into Christianity, and I think the demographic of people that are converted by Alpha are, f are far more likely to be the people who are convinced by those personal testimonies than by anything else in the content of Alpha. Well, you grew up Christian, but are now an atheist, and obviously you weren't converted during your time on the Alpha course. But overall, what did you take away from the experience? Was it a negative experience, or did you enjoy it? Yes, I did enjoy it, but I'll quickly go pick up on one point that, that you made about, um, no, I, I didn't come away convinced by anything uh, in Alpha. In fact, one of the Christians on the Alpha course predicted by week three, by week three that, that that was my state and that there would be nothing in Alpha that would convince me. And yes, she was absolutely right. But I did enjoy Alpha and I enjoyed it for the personal interaction. I got exposed to so interesting new people, some people who I genuinely like. And um, when when lockdown ends, there are a couple of them which I'm probably going to connect with and uh, try and go and make a personal visit to because they were genuinely lovely people. And I really liked having my weekly conversations with them. I've already said that. So on that aspect, yes, I did enjoy Alpha. Did I enjoy the exposure to Christianity that I got? 
not really because I didn't find any of it convincing, but it was very useful in for me to be able to get into the thinking behind Alpha and um, to to understand some of the motivations behind Alpha. But yeah, Alpha did nothing for me at all. Okay, that was so fascinating. And thanks again, Matthew, for your time and for all of your insights into the world of Alpha. I will leave links to your written works and podcasts in the description below. And hopefully you can come back on to Talk Beliefs again one day in the not too distant future. Yeah, th thank you for this. It'll be great to come back and talk about other aspects uh, of, my, of my life, but of my Christianity. Maybe I'll have another project that's going on. Uh, we shall see, but it's been, been great having this conversation.